Hey everyone, how's it going? Forrest here, again with another installment of my complete analysis of all of JSBox chorale harmonizations. Today we have a long chorale to look at, so I hope you are looking forward to a longer video. We're looking at Nun lo mein Ziel den Herren, which translates to Now praise my soul, the Lord. I have two, pretty much two complete pages. This is a chorale that has instrumental interludes, however, I omitted them because we're only looking at the vocal writing, as is the purview of the um, journey that I'm on to analyze all of the chorales. So uh, there are instrumental swaths that I removed from this particular arrangement, so if you're looking for a complete analysis of this particular movement, you're going to have to find it elsewhere where they analyze all of the instrumental works, but we're going to be looking at the harmonic activity going on in the voices alone. Um, it's very interesting. There's lots of uh, twists and turns and harmonic irregularities throughout the chorale, but because there are some longer sections where I presume there are developments in the instruments that make the modulations a little bit more seamless, I'm just going to mark them as uh, direct modulations signifying the fact that we've moved from one key to the next, even though there might be common chord modulations going on within the instruments. But because we're looking at only the vocal writing, that's not uh, particularly relevant to this specific analysis. So starting things off, we start with uh, one sharp in the key signature and on G major. We also end on G major, so I reckon we're in the key of G major for this chorale, but we go all over the place. We start off with passing tones in the lower voices before we get B, D, D, and G. That's G major in first inversion, so we'll just change the figured bass, neighbor tone in the bass, and passing tone in the tenor before we get B, B, D, and G. That's another G major triad in first inversion, no need to reanalyze. And then we have C, a and E here happening off the harmonic rhythm. C, A, E, and G spells A minor 7 in first inversion. That's 2, 6, 5. We know that Bach loves 2, 6, 5 chords, but we're seeing it in the middle of a phrase. We don't really see the end of a phrase until we get to the beginning of the fourth complete measure. Um, so this 2, 6, 5 chord, typically we would expect it to go to 5, which um, for all intents and purposes, it does kind of go to 5. We have D, D, and F sharp, but instead of A, we have B. So a bit of a deceptive progression in that regard. This is uh, B minor in first inversion, which would be 3, 6. Uh, but still, 3, 6, and 5 are very similar chords to one another, so 2, 6 is totally fine uh, going here. This D is also a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. We then have E, B, D, and E. Now, under normal circumstances, I would mark these as accented non-chord tones and look immediately to the next beat. However, three wants to go to this chord, despite the fact that there is no third in the chord. This would be an E minor 7 chord in root position, so 6, 7, but there is no third. And the reason why, like I said, three wants to go to six, so that's why I am analyzing it this way. We do have some passing tones as well, where we spell out F sharp, A, C, and E, which is F sharp minor 7 flat 5 in root position, that is 7, 7, and 6 going to 7 is a relatively normative progression. And kind of the same way that 2, 6 is going to 3 here, and it's fulfilling a lot of where the voices want to resolve, but we're not getting the complete chordal movement that we would expect. We get the same thing here. We have 7 going to G, B, and sorry, G, G, and B, and E, which is uh, E minor in first inversion, so 6, 6. And that 6, 6 chord, um, for this, like I said, the same reason, it's an adjacent harmony, so uh, the chord is resolving two-thirds of the way that we would expect it to. Um, however, it's not following the cycle of falling fifths, so we're only seeing two of the voices resolve the way we would expect rather than all three. Uh, we also have more passing tones, or we have two, a, a neighbor tone and two passing tones, which gives us another uh, F sharp minor 7 flat 5 chord, A, F sharp, C, and E, which would be uh, 7, 6, 5, and the handwriting is going to get very cramped just because I did not want to print this onto three pages. If, uh, I didn't really see a reason to print it on the three separate pages. But 7, 6, 5, we have this uh, 
oscillation between 6 and 7 and 6 and 7 before we eventually get to G major, B, G, D, and D, which is G major in first inversion. That's 1, 6. We have a passing tone in the tenor. This B is still a chord tone, so we don't need to analyze it um, as a known chord tone. We then have uh, E, B, D, and E. Again, uh, to be consistent with the analysis that we had at the beginning of this measure, I am going to call this a 6-7 chord. However, under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have really analyzed it that way. But because the harmonic rhythm is so fast over the course of this chorale, we're getting chords on pretty much every eighth note at, uh, during this section. I feel like there's intention here, and the third being absent um, doesn't necessarily mitigate, it, uh, mitigate our ability to... Um, discern what chord is happening here, especially because it's functioning the way that we expect it to. Um, but this D is a passing seventh, this C is a known chord tone, this D is a seventh and also a known chord tone, this B is a chord tone, this C is a chord tone, and if you pull out all the notes there, there is the makings of kind of like a D7, but we have this G suspended in the melody, which kind of derails all of that potential analysis, but in the counterpoint there are some chords to infer if you wanted to be particularly granular and not uh, picky about other voices being suspended. Uh, regardless, um, I'm not going to write any of those down because we don't have any complete chords. But after our, e, our incomplete E minor, um, oh you know what, I take that back, We this is, an in, this is a complete e, uh, e minor 7 because we have E, B, D, and G as opposed to this voice here, um, that is, uh, our, the melody is E at this point rather than G. If the melody had been G right here, we would have a complete E minor 7 chord. So there we go, that solves our problem. My uh, bad reading <laughs> solves the problem. We then have a C, G, E, and G. That's C major in root position, which is a 4 chord in the key of G major. We have a passing 7th in the bass. We have two passing tones here. We have a passing A and a passing 7th here in the tenor. Uh, this G is a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. We then have A, C, F sharp, and A. And we could call this a 7 chord. However, I think that, you know, with the harmonic rhythm and the way that we're deriving chords from the texture in this particular chorale, I think this is actually a um, five chord. We have D, D, F sharp, and A, and this C and this A, I don't think they're, I mean, they're chord tones, but you have to put together everything that's happening across the whole beat in order to get the whole picture. So I think that this is a five seven chord um, but if you want to call it a seven chord and call these d's just you know movement to get to the uh, to our imperfect authentic cadence um, then by all means but i look at the big picture here and see that there's just a five seven chord going on looking ahead we have a perfect authentic cadence in the key of G major or a faux perfect authentic cadence. It's not really a traditional cadence in terms of how Bach typically frames them. There's, uh, you know, chorale, the, the, the voices are arranged like a chorale while the rest of the instruments are providing a very rich and um, rapidly moving accompaniment. So they don't get the cadence with the same amount of freedom that they do when the voices are the only instruments involved. But starting things off, we have G, D, G, and B. That's another G major triad. No need to mark it. We have G, F sharp, A, and D. So this is kind of like a five chord over a G pedal, but I'm not going to mark it. I'm just going to mark this F sharp and this A as a non-chord tones, so a neighbor tone. And I believe that's one definition for a poggiatura where you skip into it and then step out of it in the opposite direction. And then we see E, E, G, and B. That's E minor in root position, which is 6. And then we have uh, D sharp here, F sharp, F sharp, and B. That's a B major over D sharp. So off the harmonic rhythm, we get 5, 6 of 6, which is um, the dominant of the chord that we just saw, E minor. And we would expect that to go to E minor, E, E, G, and B, which it does. It goes to our 6 chord again. So a brief tonicization of E minor. One might even make the argument that we move to E minor here briefly before going back to G major, but I don't see it. I think this D sharp is, the fact that we get 
E minor before the V chord, I think, is incidental more, or maybe not incidental, but um, just uh, this is sort of like a, no, nah, this is one whole idea. This is maybe like one step beyond tonicization, but not quite into the realm of modulation yet. That's how I see it, but you might see it in another way. Uh, we also have B, G, D, and B. Um, I'm going to make the argument that Oh, never mind, that B is a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it, but I'm going to make the argument here that we that this, well, this D is a non-chord tone, but we're getting a 1-6 chord here off the harmonic rhythm because we're going to get a 4 chord immediately after this 6 chord, and I feel like I hear 1 going to 4 here. When I'm listening to the chorale, we have C, G, E, and B, that's C major 7, which is 4-7. Uh, this B is a passing seventh, but part of the chord, so we don't need to mark it like we typically would. We have A, A, E, and C. That's A minor in root position, which is two. Passing tone in the bass before we get C, A, F sharp, and A. And uh, typically, I would call this a... Oh, actually, I am going to call this a five chord. However, um, the C, obviously, I mean, it is kind of like an accent and non-chord tone because I am going to call it a five chord, but do bear in mind the fact that the D happens at the same time. Uh, I'm actually going to walk that back. I'm going to call this C an accent and non-chord tone, and I'm going to call this three, six, just like how we saw two go to three, six earlier. We're seeing two go to three, six here as well, but I think the argument for a five chord happening here because this B is so brief um, is valid as well, but I'm going to call this a 3-6 chord because we've seen this 2-3 to three progression earlier. It's also happening at the same point in the measure, so maybe there's some intention to that. Uh, but then we have E, B, G, and G. That's E minor in root position. 3 wants to go to 6, so that's a good sign as well. We have C, which is a non-chord tone. E, which is a chord tone. This F sharp is a non-chord tone. This G and this A. Uh, this A is a non-chord tone, but it's kind of hard to pick things out over 16th notes, but this C, E, G, and A combination is A minor 7 over C, which is 2, 6, 5. 6 wants to go to 2. That's a good sign. And then we have D, D, F sharp, and A, which is D major in root position. That's a 5 chord with a neighboring 7th in the bass before we get D, C, F sharp, and A. So the 5 chord turns into a root position 5-7 chord, D7. This D is an anticipation, but also a chord tone before we get G major, G, B, D, and G. Already, you know, I'd be done at some points when it comes to a chorale with this much density. So the fact that we have six, between 6 and 8 more phrases, depending on how you break the chorale down, um, we have a lot in store. Oh, and also... Uh, I forgot to <laughs> to remove the uh, the copyright here with the with the MIDI data. However, it is there. I hope it's not an eyesore. It does get a little bit in the way of the analysis, though. But uh, yes, so we are looking ahead to the next phrase, which is in. Uh, we have a similar structure to the A section, where we have two phrases that are adjoined, and we have like a pseudo cadence followed by more of a intentional, or uh, intentional is the wrong word, more of, of a cadence that uh, feels final because the voices are ending. Okay, three, two, one. However, we're going to start off this phrase in the key of E minor, and like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, all modulations that don't happen within a phrase are going to just be direct modulations because the instruments could be setting up the modulation. Chances are they are. Um, in the cases with these chorales uh, that have instrumental interludes, the cadences uh, or the modulations rather do happen within the instruments. So we start things off with E, B, E, and G. That's E minor, which is our tonic and root position neighboring seventh in the alto. This B is a chord tone before we get C, G, E, and G. That's C major in root position, which is our six chord. So one going to six. We've seen this before. Um, we have a passing tone in the bass here before we get E, C, E, and G. That's C major in first inversion, so we'll just change the figure bass. 
passing tone in the uh, bass as well before we get G sharp, B, E, and B. That's E major over G sharp, which is a secondary dominant. That's 5, 6 of 4, because it's also the dominant of A, which we would presume to be on the next beat. But before that, we get E sharp, G, or sorry, E, G sharp, E, and B, which is like taking the chord and putting it in root position, so I'll mark that. And then we get A minor, A, C, E, and A, which is our four chord. We have a passing seventh here before we get F, C, D sharp, and A. That's D sharp, uh, fully diminished seventh over F sharp, which would be seven, uh, six, five. Uh, no half diminished symbol like we typically get. We have a passing uh, tone in the bass. We also have another passing tone in the alto before we get D sharp, B, F sharp, and B. Uh, that is B major over D sharp, which is 5, 6. So when we see 7 and 5, 6 next to one another, it's less of a progression really happening because there's no functional change between the two chords. It's still like a very tense moment. But uh, the chords are distinct in this case because of the introduction of the B in two of the voices. So... I guess technically three of the voices because we get B here on the last eighth note of the measure as well. But even though it kind of looks like we're going to a root position triad here, we are getting rid of the third by doing so. So I tend to not analyze these instances. But we do see some instances where it turns into a root position triad, like here, where we have either a voice being replaced that's doubled or two voices are moving. So the voice that would be getting removed is being uh, compensated for. So then we have E, B, E, and G. That's our tonic triad, E minor. This G right here is like taking the triad and putting it in first inversion, so I'll go ahead and mark that. And then we have A, C, E, and F sharp. That's F sharp minor 7 flat 5 over A, which is 2, 6, 5. This F, kind of for the same reason, is kind of like taking the chord and putting it in root position, but I don't really see the point because it's uh, taking away from a completely voiced chord. It's more of like a, a gesture that adds activity to the bass in this case than anything else. And then we get B, B, D, and, or D sharp and F sharp, which is B major, like we learned from the last measure. That is our dominant. Passing seventh in the tenor. The bass leaps down an octave, so we don't need to mark that. And then we get our pseudo perfect authentic cadence here in the key of E minor, E, G, E, and E. Um, and this also coincides with our modulation to D major, because at the end of this phrase we have a perfect authentic cadence, more like, you know, kind of more of a perfect authentic cadence like we had at the end of the A section, um, because it's followed by significant rest in the voices, so it feels more cadential, even though the instruments are continuing to chug along. Uh, but this E minor chord, E, G, E, and E, is also functioning like our supertonic in the key of D major. And interestingly, we see the E minor chord turn into an E minor 7 with the 7th in the bass here. It's kind of unusual. I know you've seen it, uh, you know, maybe a handful of times, but 2-4-2 two, two chords are relatively uncommon. We have D, G, E, and E. So uh, the fact that we don't have a 3rd in the or a 5th in the chord is kind of interesting with the 7 as well. Uh, but nonetheless, this is a 4-2 chord. Um, and then we are in the realm of D major. C sharp, A, E, and A is A over C sharp, which is our dominant and first inversion. Neighbor tone in the bass and in the alto. Before we get C sharp, A, E, and G, that is taking the chord and turning it into a seven chord in first inversion, so we'll just change it to six, five. And then we get root position seven chord happening on the offbeat because we have A, A, C sharp, and G, which is an incomplete 7 chord, but a 7 chord nonetheless, so we'll call it 7, 5, 3. And then we have uh, D, A, D, and F sharp, which is our tonic triad in root position. And that triad kind of gets turned into first inversion, F sharp, A, D, and F sharp on the and of the beat. We then get B, G, D, and G, which is G major in first inversion, that is 4, 6 with a passing tone in the bass and in the tenor before we get G, B, D, and F sharp, which is taking the chord and putting it 
in root position, but also turning it into a 7 chord, so we'll just change the figured bass. We have a neighboring 7th here in the bass, but that is a chord tone in this instance. Um, we then have G, B, D, and E. That is E minor over G. That would be 2-6. Bach loves 2-6 chords. This A is a non-chord tone. This A is a non-chord tone. This C sharp is a non-chord tone, but when you take the sum of all the notes that are happening off the harmonic rhythm, we get a major that's a five chord, and this G turns into a passing seventh before we cadence on D major, D, F sharp, A, and D, which is our tonic triad. Okay, that was a very dense chorale, and that's pretty much the regular um, harmonic rhythm for the rest of the chorale. There are going to be instances where it is lighter than this, but part of the reason why this chorale is as dense as it is is because of... Uh, like the length, and I feel like there's this vocal matching, at least in the bass, um, where the voices are matching the unrelenting, you know, like sewing machine typewriter style rhythm that Bach is known uh, is known for in terms of writing for instruments, like a uh, Brandenburg Five. I think of when uh, when I think of that unrelenting sort of eighth note or sixteenth note, depending on the tempo of the piece. Um, but moving ahead, we have an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of E minor. So we're going to move back to E minor here. Uh, however, we're going to do so through G major. I think that we start in the key of G major. That's just what it sounds like to me. Um, I don't really think we have a reason to start analyzing in the key of E minor here until we get to the C sharp, or I guess technically a beat beforehand, because it clearly sounds like G major in the melody. So we start off with B. F sharp, D, uh, B, and D rather, excuse me. That's B minor in root position, which is our three chord. And then we get E minor, E, G, B, and G. So three going to six here. Kind of sounds like a minor five going to one if you're listening in an E minor lens, but it really does feel like this melody is in G major if you just isolate it as its own idea. So I'm convinced that we start in G major. Then we have F sharp, A, F sharp, and G. Um, I think the harmonic rhythm really slows down here. However, um, F sharp, A, F sharp, and this E is a passing seventh, even though we have this G suspended. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mark these as passing tones, because I really do feel like these, the harmonic rhythm has slowed down with this G suspended in the melody, but technically speaking, I think to make this uh, chord progression seem a little bit more normative, even though we have this G suspended here, I'm going to call this a 5-6 chord. And I know what you're thinking, if this were a 5-6 chord, where's the D, right? A 5 chord in the key of G would be D. So if that's the case, then this would be an F-sharp diminished chord, and we would call that 7. However, almost exclusively with the seven chords that we see Bach uh, spell, he never doubles the leading tone, which makes me feel like this uh, this D is sort of the, the D that should be occurring in this chord, and this chord is just uh, anticipating or preceding the D that it will eventually get. So the five and the one are sort of operating in the context in which they share that same that same D. Uh, but there is definitely some type of dominance happening here with this G suspended in the melody kind of in the same way that we have, um, there was an instance earlier in the crawl where we had a G suspended somewhere and it uh, slowed things down or kept me from analyzing something in a particular way. It might be right here, this G right here where we have the D, the C, and the C. There's like some dominance going on in the context of G major, but with the G above it, it slows it down. So this definitely feels like that's happening here. Uh, but regardless, the Leading tone does resolve where it's supposed to go, G, B, D, and G, which is our tonic triad, and also where I think we move to the key of E minor. This is now our three chord, and now we're in the realm of E minor, and we get melodic minor immediately in the bass with this uh, diminished fifth leap going down, very awkward interval to sing, uh, C sharp, A, E, and A. That's A major over C sharp, um, not a secondary dominant, but rather a harmonization of the melodic minor scale. This is a major subdominant triad in first inversion. 
We then have D sharp, A, F sharp, and B, which is B7 over D sharp, and that's 565. 4, 6 going to 5, 6, 5, or even 4, 6, 5 going to 5, 6, 5 is a relatively common progression in minor chorales. And then we have E, G, G, and C. So a bit of a deceptive progression here. We would expect E minor. And for all intents and purposes, we do get E minor, except for instead of B, we have C. And that makes it a C major triad in first inversion. So another 6, 6 chord. Uh, that will reverse course and will eventually get E minor by the end of the phrase. Again, we have D sharp, B, F sharp, and B. So in this case, we have another B major triad, but instead of the seventh, we have the root doubled. So this is still a 5-6 chord, just not a 5-6-5. Five, five. We then have C sharp, E, E, and A. That's A major in first inversion again, which is 4-6. And then we have D sharp, B, F sharp, and B again. That's B major in first inversion, another 5-6 chord. And then we have E minor, E, B, E, and G, which is our tonic triad in root position, finishing off our phrase in the key of E minor. And we are on the second page, which... Uh, Looking at it now, it's not as dense as I remember it being when I first analyzed it, but it still is relative, uh, relatively hefty. This is one of the more contrapuntal uh, corrals we've looked at. So starting things off, we have uh, more defined phrases. As you can see, pretty much all of the phrases moving forward except for the end of the corral, which takes a similar form to like the A section where we have two adjoined phrases. Each section has a gap between it basically with three beats like a displaced measure where we have um, a pickup and two beats and then it starts on another pickup rather than a complete measure in between the two but this phrase is in the key of a minor it's kind of an interesting phrase we start with c c e and g that's c major in root position which is three this g is a chord tone this b is a passing seventh we've seen this figure before where we have a chord um, let's see if we can find it on the first page where we start off like right here. In this case, it's a neighbor tone, but we have a passing or some type of non-chord uh, non tone seventh going on in one voice. And then the bass leaps down to the fifth of the chord. Um, I think we see it one more time as well. Or we might see it later in the crawl. But we've seen this similar gesture of the bass leaping down to the fifth of the chord and then going up. Uh, same sort of thing is happening here. Um, but then we have A, A, E, and C. That's A minor in root position. So C going to A, 3 going to 1 is a relatively unusual progression. Uh, it's a thirds progression, and it's just two stable chords going from one to the next, and they share two notes in common because they're a third apart. So it's not super progressional, but it is introducing one note to the texture. So I guess there's that. It's really one... Um, I guess one tier higher in terms of uh, introducing notes to the texture. It's like pretty much akin to just repeating the same chord twice or rotating it because you're only you're not you're not really contributing much more over the course of the the beats that the chords are occupying. But regardless, we have a neighboring uh, seventh, a major seventh here, which is interesting. G sharp leading tone. And then we have A, A, E, and C again, which is A minor. Again, with the bass leaping down a fourth to the fifth of the chord before we get F, A, D, and B, which is B minor 7 flat 5 over F, which is 2, 4, 3. Kind of interesting to see a 2, 4, 3 chord. Typically, we see these kind of confused for 4, 6 chords in a Phrygian half cadence situation, but... Um, sometimes we see two, four, three chords. There's really no reason why they can't exist. Um, I guess we could also make the argument that this is a seven chord, which now that I'm looking at it, I am. I tricked myself. You could make the argument that this is a two, four, three chord. However, I'm going to make the argument that this A is a uh, sort of like a, what would we call it? It's like a three, almost like a three, two suspension. But this corral's been kind of interesting. Um, I realize a 3-2 suspension doesn't really make sense from a functional standpoint because the point of a suspension is, from, is for a suspended tone to turn into a consonance eventually after whatever ornamentation um, there is, if there is any in the suspension. But here, I feel like this G-sharp might be operating more like the chord tone here, especially because the tonic is on the other side. Uh, so 
I'm going to call this a 742 chord, G sharp, um, B, D, and F natural. So a fully diminished G sharp. Um, so it would be a 742 or a 243. I feel like it, it really, uh, I feel like the more that I talk about it, it makes less sense because we have C, A, C, and A here, which this F is uh, sort of like an accented non-chord tone, and we could make the argument that a 6 chord is happening here if this F is the way that you hear it, but again, the bass leaps down to the the third of, uh, sorry, the fifth of the chord, and then we get A minor in a uh, first inversion as a result. So whether you see two going to six or seven going to one or some type of permutation of combining the two together, I'm going to commit to seven and one just because of the fact that I feel like ultimately um, that's how I, but the, the seventh isn't resolving the way that we would expect. Um, in the case of the, uh, I guess the seventh does technically resolve the way that we would expect to the G sharp, which would be the where the chordal seventh of the B minor seven flat five chord was concerned. I think honestly, anyone's guess is as good as mine in this case, because this is kind of a hairy section, but typically if we have a tonic chord on the end, it's more likely that we're going to have a 7 chord before it rather than a 2 chord. That's the that that's my predisposition, but if you feel like you have a different opinion on the matter, that's totally fine as well. But eventually we get uh, D, D, F, and B. That's another, uh, that's another um, sorry, B diminished triad in first inversion, so 2, 6. And then we get E, D, E, and B, again with this idea of the E7 chord without the third. Um, we know that a 5-7 chord is being implied here, but there's no G sharp to um, uh, complete the spelling of the chord. But ultimately, our perfect authentic cadence does conclude with a tonic triad. Chances are there's a G sharp happening in one of the instruments here to fill it out, because there's like five or six different instruments. I believe there's clarinet, oboe, first and second violin, viola, cello, and there's continuo as well, so seven instruments, or yeah, seven parts that are um, being written for as well, if I'm remembering correctly. I might be missing one, um, but I feel like that's right from when I was looking at the, the full score and then making this uh, vocal uh, reduction, or just this vocal part. Um, okay, yes, so our next phrase probably the most interesting cadence in the entire chorale here. It's an, I'm making the argument it's an imperfect authentic cadence in the key of C, but we stay in the key of A minor up until the cadence. So we start things off with F sharp, C, D sharp, and A. So that is D sharp diminished over F sharp, which would be a secondary dominant in this case. That would be 7, 6, 5, fully diminished of five because D sharp is the leading tone to E and E is our dominant, therefore seven, six, five of five. Passing tone in the bass, passing tone in the alto, before we get D sharp, F sharp, F sharp, and B, which is B major over D sharp. We've seen this chord progression before actually, I believe. Where have we seen it? We've seen this I swear we've seen this progression before. I'm not crazy, am I? Oh goodness, maybe I am crazy. Where we've seen five and seven happening one after the other. Um, like right here, we've had F sharp, C, D sharp, and A, but in this case we are in the key of D minor. So I think we're just seeing this progression again where we're tonicizing E, but we're gonna get an E major chord because we're staying in the key of A minor until we, uh, we get to um, C major inevitably. Uh, D sharp, F sharp, F sharp, and B is 5, 6 of 5. So we have another progression where two dominants following one after the other. It's not very progressional because, for starters, they're a third apart, so they share two notes in common, but also their function is the same. So when their function is the same, uh, the, there really isn't a lot of progression, right? You're introducing two chords that operate pretty much the same way. So... What does that do to the progression? It keeps it relatively static, and maybe that's his intention. But also, if you're forced uh, into writing a particular way because you have a melody in front of you and there's only a limited 
number of chords that can fit that melody. Um, sometimes you're shoehorned into a particular situation to fit the constraints that the melody puts you in. So we have 5, 6, of 5 here. We would expect that to go to E major, which it does. This B is a chord tone as well, so we don't need to mark it. E, G sharp, E, and B. That is 5 with a passing 7th in the bass. And then we get um, C, G sharp, E, and B. Now if we look here with the B, A, E, and B, that's not really a chord. This B is a chord tone. This A is an anticipation. But if we analyze this chord, what's going on? We could make an argument that there's not really a chord being introduced here, and this is just off the harmonic rhythm, but I think we have 5 going to 3 here, but 3 is augmented. Um, C, G sharp, E, and B. So I, I think this is a 3 augmented 7th chord. 5 going to 3 is not a super unusual progression. It is deceptive in its own way, but the G sharp being in the counterpoint here, being suspended and then resolving upwards, does create that augmented triad for an extended period of time. So it's very interesting that that's happening here, and I'll commit to that analysis because ultimately speaking, unless you're making the argument that there is an accord being introduced here because the harmonic rhythm slowed down, well, I mean, I don't even know how one could make that argument because in three, four chorales, we have um, typically the harmonic rhythms are a chord on each beat like you would expect in a typical chorale or a chord on beat one and a chord on beat three, or a chord on beat one and a chord on beat two, but typically you don't see like a super mixed up medley of all of those. Typically you see like maybe one or two of the cases that isn't regular for the rest of the chorale sprinkled throughout, but I, I, I think that a chord's being introduced here. We have seen five go to three in the past as well, so that, I think that that's what's happening. But chances are it is just incidental and is part of the counterpoint, even though the chord is being introduced. Um, I guess we could make the argument that it's also like another five chord in first inversion, but the A is, uh, I guess we could make the argument that it's a, it is a six four chord, yeah, that the C is an accented non-chord tone and this G sharp and the B that happens just so happens to also occur when this A happens as well. We did see a chord on the first page that had that happen as well, right here where we have this one six chord happen. No, that's not where it happens. It happens somewhere. Somewhere on this first page that also happens where we have a note that interrupts the flow of it, but for the sake of making the argument that the chord progression that's being implied is there, um, there's something happening. Uh, but I'm gonna make the argument that it's a three seven chord, why not? Um, okay, next we have A minor, A, A, E, and C, uh, which is our tonic triad and f uh, root position, A minor. And we are starting to look for a point in which we're modulating. I think you can make the mo argument that you're modulating as early as this point right here, but I think it happens a little bit later. Um, we have A, A, E, and C here, so no need to reanalyze. Then we have E, A, E, and C with A neighboring seventh here. I guess we could make the argument that this is a 3-6 chord, but I'm going to make the argument that this is a 1-6-4 chord, uh, just because that's the way that I hear it, and we're also closing in on a cadence, so maybe we would see it followed by a 5 chord, who knows. Regardless, we have F, A, D, and D. That is uh, D minor in first inversion, which is 4-6. It also happens to be 2-6 in the key of C major. And as we're closing in on our imperfect authentic cadence, we have B, D, F, and D, which is a seven chord in first inversion, or in root position, apologies. It's a, oh, I didn't write the, I didn't write the inversion yet. But I think with everything being introduced here, we have the B, uh, the D, the B, and uh, the G happening here. I think that this is just a big five chord in first inversion that's happening over the course of two beats that eventually resolves to C major, C, G, E, and G, which is our tonic triad and root position. Uh, two, six to five going to one is much more likely than two going to seven to one for the same reason that just two to seven is uh, it's, a, it's a valid progression, but as far as all of the permutations of predominant going to dominant are concerned, 
2 going to 7 is just, I think, objectively the weakest because of the fact that it um, is a thirds progression. It's not really introducing too much. Into it. All it's introducing is the leading tone um, as opposed to any of the other combinations which introduce more notes into the texture and make the cadence sound more um, fulfilling. I think that's just the, the resulting sound and it's just coincidental because of that. Okay, looking ahead, we have another sort of faux perfect authentic cadence in the key of B minor, but I think we get to B minor through E minor. We don't just go from A to B. That's Sometimes we see uh, skips like that along the circle of fifths, but it's not super common. Not unprecedented, but it's not super common. Um, but then we have B, F sharp, D sharp, and B, which is our five chord, B major in the key of B minor, or sorry, in the key of E minor. Uh, passing tone in the bass, passing tone in the alto before we get D sharp, B, F sharp, and A, which is B7 over D sharp. That's like taking the chord and putting it in first inversion and also adding a seventh. We have a passing tone in the bass and a passing tone in the tenor this time before we get uh, F sharp, D sharp, F sharp, and A, which is kind of like adding another uh, D sharp diminished chord, there's been this theme of extending the dominance over the course of two chords in this crowd where we see five followed by seven or seven followed by five. Um, but this is a seven six chord that eventually turns back into five on beat three, B, D sharp, F sharp, and F sharp, which is a five chord in root position. I might even put this D sharp diminished chord in parentheses because if we look at the harmonic rhythm happening on beat one and beat three here, this F sharp is just a means to get back to B here. Um, but ultimately, this is just a lot of dominance happening over the course of four beats before we inevitably resolve to E minor, E, B, E, and G, which is our tonic triad. And it also happens to be our subdominant in the key of B minor. Um, let me make that B a little bit more legible. There we go. Um, and then we see the D natural here with the C sharp, which makes me feel like we're in the right direction. The C sharp's a passing tone. This F sharp is a passing tone. We then get C sharp, E, G sharp, and E. So this is melodic minor going on here. And when you harmonize the melodic minor scale with C sharp in the bass, that is, uh, or when the root is C sharp, that's C sharp minor. So our two chord turns from diminished to minor, which is interesting. We then have... Uh, not an anticipation, but a non-chord tone here in the tenor, which is just a, re or it's not a non-chord tone, apologies. It's just a repeat of the same tone, which is interesting. We then have F sharp, D natural, F sharp, and E. However, I think this D natural is an accent, a non-chord tone. We're actually looking at F sharp, C sharp, A sharp, and E, which is F sharp 7 in root position, which is 5, 7 in the key of B minor. And then we cadence on B minor. And um, sorry, this is not a perfect authentic cadence. This is an imperfect authentic cadence. B, 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 and D, which is our tonic triad and root position. Okay, looking ahead, we have a faux half cadence in the key of G major. And we're just going to call it, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, a direct modulation because we don't really know exactly when the modulation occurs in this gap, um, but it probably does. We start things off with G, B, D, and D, which is G major in root position. Again, with this idea of the bass leaping down a, fifth, a fourth and then doing something else in one of the other voices to change the harmony. But this F sharp is a seventh and a non-chord tone. Kind of gives us the idea of B minor going on here, but I'm not going to mark it. It's not super integral. This D is a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. We then have E, B, E, and G. We've had a lot of one going to six at the beginning of phrases in this particular chorale as well. It's E minor in root position. We then get B, B, D, and F sharp. That's B minor in root position, which is three, a transitive progression. We typically expect three to go to six, not the other way around, but it's okay because the voice leading works in both ways. We have a passing seventh in the alt, uh, sorry, the tenor, before we get C, G, D, and E. This really beautiful 9-8 suspension here, which is a 4 chord. This harkens back to the first progression we saw. We had one going to um, 
uh, sorry, where did we see this progression? We saw three go to four, didn't we? Am I crazy again? I might actually be crazy. I swear that we saw it. No, I'm crazy. Now I was thinking about two going to three. Here we have three going to four. So it's another adjacent progression. That's why they're connected. But I thought we had another three going to four instance here. Um, I'm, I might be confusing with another corral. I analyze these corrals every day. So forgive me if I uh, mix up some progressions that I remember from corrals of the last few days. Uh, but after our C major triad, we have G, G, B, and D. That's our tonic triad, G major in root position with the passing tone in the alto. We have F sharp, A, D, and A. That's D major over F sharp, which is 5, 6. And then we have this G here, syncopated, also sort of suspended over the bass before we get our half cadence. So this A um, right here is a non-chord tone. This D is a, uh, is a chord tone. What's sort of happening here is we're getting... Uh, G, G, E, and B. Um, I'm going to mark that. I mean, we could say that this is 6, 6, 5, but I'm just going to make the argument it's 6, 6. This F sharp is a non chord tone. This F sharp is a non chord tone. We have G, E, B, and G happening here before we get G, F sharp, D, and uh, B um, going on as well. So there are some more non-chord tones all suspended over this G implying other chords, but we're never seeing the full chord because actually the melody is also syncopated here. So with the inner voices, we have this um, rhythmic matching as well. Um, this F sharp is a non-chord tone. This D is a non-chord tone. This C sharp is a secondary leading tone. This E is a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it, but we inevitably get to five. Um, D, F sharp, D, and A, which is our dominant in the key of G major. So throughout this entire, um, throughout this entire, actually, you know what we can do on this last beat, we have G, E, C sharp, and B, which is kind of like seven, uh, four, three, uh, half diminished of five. C sharp is the leading tone to D. So that is something that we could pull out of the texture where all of the notes are present, but the rest of them are just filigree that sort of point in the direction of D. But as we're closing in on our last cadence, which is a perfect authentic cadence in the key of G major, um, there is no more modulations. We're just continuing to analyze in the key of G major. So it feels like this five chord does go to one. However, with this F natural here, I feel like it's functioning differently. I think that it's functioning as five of four, because G also happens to be the dominant of C, but there's no way to know whether or not it's functioning like a dominant unless you provide the natural seventh, which Bach does here. And it's still a passing tone, but it still tells a different story. So five of four. And we would expect C on the other side to strengthen that argument, which we do. E, G, G, and C, which is four, six, and where we would expect our chord to resolve. We then have D, D, G, and B, that's G major and second inversion. It's interesting to see a second inversion tonic triad in the middle of a phrase, but it is in a passing configuration, which is where we would expect to see a 6-4 chord. Um, but it's interesting to see a tonic 6-4 chord in the middle of a phrase. Um, we get C, E, G, and A. That's A minor 7 over C, which is 2-6-5. Another 2-6-5 chord at the, sort of in the middle of a phrase, near the cadence, but still in the middle. We then have B, D, G, and G. That is our tonic triad in first inversion, 1, 6. And then we have some pretty much all the voices moving off of the harmonic rhythm here, the bass a little bit staggered. But we have F sharp, A, C, and A. That's F sharp diminished in first inversion happening off the harmonic rhythm, which is 7, 6. And then we get G, B, G, and B, which is our tonic triad in root position. This G is a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. This A is a passing tone. This B is an, a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. This C is a non-chord tone, so we'll mark it. And then we have D, D, F sharp, and A, which is our five chord, passing seventh in the tenor. This D is a chord tone, so we don't need to mark it. And then finally, our last chord to cap off this incredibly long analysis is G major. Uh, G, B, D, and G, which 
concludes this chorale. Now, with the case of the chorales that have instrumental interludes, and there are quite a few on this channel, I'd say there's upwards of maybe 10, no more than a dozen, but maybe 10 of my episodes uh, have included me taking out the instrumental interludes. I have asked myself whether or not I want to include them, and I do because they're considered um, chorales by most of the collections that I've I've uh, encountered, so I want to be as thorough as possible by analyzing them. But because they're accompanied by instruments and they sort of push the boundaries of what I would consider homorhythmic, um, they are more challenging to analyze. They take on more of like an instrumental form. Like uh, I'm not sure if you've ever analyzed instrumental music in comparison to vocal music or in comparison to a chorale but sometimes the harmonies are much more uh, hidden. They're sort of hidden in plain sight where you have to uh, use your ear a lot more liberally to infer certain chords happening over the span of a phrase, especially with like solo um, instrumental music where chords are implied, but you never get, you know, you never get anything that really... Uh, unless you're uh, listening to a harmonic instrument like a, like a piano where you can comp in one hand and then you have a melody in the other hand um, but when you're l looking at vocal music like this it's kind of pushing that same boundary where um, without the full context it's difficult to fully discern why some of the chord progressions are the way they are but that being said we do have a relatively comprehensive um outlook on what's happening harmonically. Sometimes we don't have all the notes that we need, sometimes we have more notes than we need, uh, but we have a general idea of the chord progressions that were used throughout this chorale. Uh, but on that note, if you're interested in following me along on this journey to analyze all of the chorale harmonizations, feel free to subscribe to the channel, hit the notification icon, you'll be notified of when my daily upload goes live, and uh, I'd be more than happy to have you along on the journey. But thank you so much for watching the video. Uh, it really means a lot. Thank you so much for supporting the channel by doing so. I look forward to tomorrow's analysis, and I hope you take care.